Thank you everyone for joining us for this panel. This panel was designed to be one of the most informative and action-oriented panels that you'll attend. I'm Katie Gross, Chief Customer Officer of the Real-Time Market Research Platform, Suzy. And we partner with hundreds of the world's top brands in helping them identify more agile ways to tap consumers for insights that drive business growth. And I'm joined on the virtual stage today by three absolute powerhouses of insights leaders. So I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves. And ladies first, I'm going to start with you, Kim. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kim Spade. I lead insights at Kraft Heinz. Uh, specifically, I'm in a new role now, moving from managing our joint ventures to now a role within the global growth organization. Right now, I focused on uh, some initiatives within our ESG around nutrition and sustainability, rolling that out. I'm also looking at our trends program and looking to relaunch that in an exciting way in 2021. I'm looking at new tools, including Agile um, and methods uh, and looking to uh, deploy those more within the organization. And I'm happy to be here today. Thanks. Awesome. Over to you, Nick. Hi, everybody. Nick Graham. I have the pleasure of heading up Consumer Insights and Analytics for PepsiCo's US Beverages Business Unit. Um, so. All the names you'll know, Pepsi, Mountain Dew, Bubbly, Gatorade, Tropicana, um, all of those. And um, the team that I lead basically manage the full cycle of brand strategy, innovation strategy, supporting creative development, innovation, um, et cetera, right the way through to, to in market. And in addition to that, I also have a portfolio role in terms of looking after portfolio strategy. And we've worked obviously closely with uh, Susie uh, um, and the team in really building out our capabilities for some of our longer term consumer tracking as well. So yeah, excited to be here and uh, talk more about this. Amazing. And very much last but not least, Elliot. Hi, I'm Elliot Rosen. I am an acquisition and growth marketing expert for Unilever. I work within an exciting team on the beauty and personal care portfolio. And we have the mandate, which is kind of different than Unilever's long-term strategy or what you probably know us for, um, for acquiring brands and then giving them a scale, is we actually have a mandate to create new business. So I've been working, um, you know, my uh, entry point with Suzy is that we're using a lot of uh, consumer research in order to, first of all, ideate, but also validate and launch these new businesses. So yeah, really excited to be here and I uh, can't wait for it. Amazing. All right. I'm going to get us started with a nice, easy question. How has this year, COVID-19, impacted insights within your company? Kim, we'll turn back to you. Sure. Um, you know, I think for us, and it's probably true for everyone, there was that initial moment of just halting, just stopping. So, you know, works that had been in progress, we just stopped. We reflected for a while. I think when we all realized that, okay, it's not going to be just a two week lockdown, but it's going to be for a longer you know, point, we said, okay, what's next? And the what's next, what we questioned, even one, is it appropriate to, to have conver other conversations right now? And even if it is appropriate, um, can consumers have other conversations right now? Um, so for us, I think those are the first questions we, we grappled with. Uh, a lot of our partners even helped us understand some of those things. And then we dipped our toe in, honestly, with agile solutions, like what were, there were easy ways, like let's, well, let's start having that conversation and let's see if we can. And what we found was that we could. Mm -hmm. That's great. Did you find something similar over at um, Unilever, Elliot? I was bound to be the first person to start talking <laughs> while I was on mute. Um, I, think, I think there's two things. I think things have changed, but also, maybe it was just a slap in the face that, you know, change ha was always happening before as well. Um, but I think that um, obviously the speed at which consumer preferences and behaviors are changing or have changed now is a completely different animal than it was before. I read a report that had this, this line, which um, was around like five years of consumer change happened in five months. So whether that is specifically to like e seeing the rate of e-commerce adoption, the digitalization of different services and business models, um, something that was like before happening kind of like piecemeal, we saw consumers jump into like headlong. So um, what I mean, what I meant, 
what I referenced earlier, like things are different, but also kind of the same is maybe we've become comfortable before because the rate of change was a bit slower. Uh, so thinking that as these CPG companies, we were actually addressing change adequately. Um, and it's become, I, I'm pretty sure um, Kim and Nick can, can speak to this, it's become the new challenge is, oh, wait, we have to be doing this a lot more frequently, a lot faster. Um, so yeah, it's a big change, but at the same time, I think it's actually just illuminating that these changes were happening before and we might not have just, a, a bit, since they weren't as acute, we might not have been paying attention. Yeah, really nicely put. Nick, please feel free to jump in here. Oh, it's, it's always hard to be last, isn't it? Because all the good <laughs> comments have gone. Um, but at least I'm not on mute, so I guess that's something. Now, I think, I was thinking about this, that I think there's almost a bit of a, I feel a bit of a dichotomy in terms of this year. It was funny you said that was an easy question. I think it's actually quite a hard question, really, because so much has changed and nothing has changed at the same time as, as Elliot was just sort of um, alluding to. And then in one respect, I feel probably more energized and excited to be part of Insights um, and leading an Insights team than ever, because um, I think we have a seat at the table now for business decisions and particularly as the business looks forward to the future that I think we've all been pushing for, yearning for, building and reinforcing for some time. And it feels like that day has arrived. And that's obviously is really exciting and really energizing for the team. I think on the, so that's one side. I think on the other side, it's more stressful than ever, I think, because obviously that role comes with different expectations. And I think for a lot of us is, I think back to what Elliot was just saying, I think a lot of us have gotten used to a certain pace of change, which meant that you could do things like build forecasting models that relied on historical data. Um, you had the time to collect data to make predictions. You had some certainty about what the future, oh, not certainty, you had some more stability about what the future might look like. And so I think what we found is the bifurcate, it's the sort of triangulation of great seat at the table. We wanna hear from insights. We wanna know what the consumer and the shopper is thinking. Um, fantastic spotlight, great. However, um, at the same time, fluid dynamic environment, really hard to predict what's gonna happen next because um, scientists don't know what's gonna happen next. So with the best one in the world, I don't know what's gonna happen next. Um, my team doesn't know. And then as, as, as we were just saying, I think a lot of the changes we've been going through as an industry, big data, free, uh, speed and agility, um, the sort of hybridization of qualitative and quantitative research, all of that that's been going on at a, a decent pace, but at a moderate pace over the past few years, suddenly that's got to accelerate massively because in order to respond to this new environment. So I think all of those things coming together is like incredibly exciting, but sometimes a bit terrifying because there's so much to do and so much um, pressure and focus on the team that it's, um, yeah, so there's highs and lows in, ev in every situation like this. Yeah. yeah. I actually had a client say to me recently that they're being asked what does the consumer think and when when will we get back to normal so they're asking consumers when do you think you're going to get back to normal and actually nobody really knows right, what, yeah. what's going to come nick you raise a really yeah. good point about the kind of pressure that your teams are under how are you all feeling about the kind of the new pressure that you're feeling to identify growth are you being held accountable in different ways um i think something for me my past before coming into cpg was in um SaaS tech marketplaces so a lot of the, the tech world and i think in the tech world you've always had this idea that you have your build measure learn loop and the faster you can kind of enter into the build part and you know segue into to measure them the, as soon as you get it going um that's where you really unlock growth and insights that are owned i think in the cpg world this the time between build and measure pre-covid was much longer and a lot more difficult. And because of the aforementioned like speed and the demands and actually bringing insights to the table more often and more frequently, kind of as a, before was an honorary member and now it's a real driver of the discussion. You're seeing uh, sort of, you're seeing CBG eat a little bit off of the tech SaaS models plate. So I think that the expectation is uh, to get out there and start measuring as soon as possible. Um, 
Yeah, that's, that's right. I think that that's the, instead of having the kind of the holy grail answer for where growth lies, it's can you get out there and start testing and experimenting and showing feedback to kind of build off of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then maybe just to build off some of the things that Elliot said, and I, I agree with everything he said, like growth, I'm getting both. I want the crystal ball. So I think increasingly looking at, uh, you know, the data lake, data analytics, data science, and where can we get better at predicting and quantifying. So I'm getting that, you know, getting that request a lot. And then I don't know that COVID has really impacted the agile or the speed, but I really feel that agile tools have moved us from this place of validation to iterative co-creation. It's just fundamentally the way that I do my job for the past couple of years has changed and is con changing continually. So when Elliot said the story about trends accelerating five years, I do feel that COVID has more fundamentally changed the organization. There were probably some of us in the organization that were more willing to experiment with what was maybe deemed by some as less tried and true, where now this has, has, has forced the adoption of many tools in the try. And I think then, you know, the resulting delight at how you can really move to this more test and learn in real time place and more iterative. Yeah, it's very interesting. And the, yeah, think, uh, go ahead, Nick. No, sorry, I was gonna say, I think, I think absolutely it's the same. It's the, I think the, the realities of the last six to however many, many months it's been, it feels like a, a never ending now. Um, I think some of the things we talked about doing, both as insights and analytics and as a broader uh, marketing and, and CPG um, world, we just had to do in, in the last few months, right? There has, there's not been time to make a, to have a long deliberative discussion about something, we have to move quickly. And so I think to what Kim and Elliot were just saying, it's not like, oh, I would like this to be faster. It's like, no, this ha like the, a decision is being made on Friday and we need to, to influence it or we're going to do this right this week and we're going to learn and we're going to um, learn from that and then iterate next week. And so I think a lot of things we've talked about doing, we've just had to start doing, which I think has been, I love what you were saying, Kim. I feel like it's actually taken some of the constraints off because before people might say, oh, but is that the best way to do it? And is, you know, shouldn't we go back to this way? And this was the tri yeah, tried and true way, or this was the data-based way. And the reality is we, we don't have that luxury and actually people are much more willing, there's a, the tolerance for, I'm going to use risk in inverted commas, but the tolerance for change has, has massively increased because there is no really any alternative. And I think, you know, I've said this before, once you actually get into using agile tools and using more disruptive tools, you're like, oh, actually this isn't, many people go, oh, this isn't what I was expecting. Oh, I love the fact that we get speed. Oh, I'm not really trading off some of the quality that I thought I was going to trade off. And so it's just, it's broken down some of those inherent barriers to change that I think we, we've all faced. So it's, uh, it's definitely been, um, I think as you talked about Elliot, it's been an accelerant to things that were already there. It's definitely unlocked that. And yeah. I think one huge point that you call out is it often opens the opportunity to have any consumer point of view. Versus just, we're, guess what? We're making a business decision on Friday. We would love to have consumer, but before that just wasn't an option. Like now, it, it really you know, opens up that we can inform through consumer or other data, which is incredible. Yeah, and whereas before some avenues to get consumer feedback or data were kind of put on the back burner because of the tried and tested, when, when times are good, it's very easy to default to tried and tested. I think when crisis comes around, it's in a way, easier to propose uh, creative ways to go about these things. And I think that now people are more open to that because when the answer has to come this week, when it has to do with something that is you know, new and novel, um, anything really goes. I mean, if you're gonna use a, an avenue and you have a strategy behind it, it's a lot more open to that than defaulting to what's been done before. And I think just to build on that, I think the, you prompted the thought, which was, I think as well in the past, it's actually, it's both of you sort of made me, it kind of came together as you, were, as you were talking, which is, I think in the past, particularly in a lot of the categories we operate in, we're often working with really smart, really senior executives who know the categories really well. And so, you know, rightly are very consumer centric, they understand their consumer, they understand their categories. 
And so I think sometimes it's, it's been easier to say, well, we, we, we can move ahead. We know the consumer. I think what's actually one of the helpful things, I think, for our industry has been the last few months is no one believes they know the consumer or because so much is changing so quickly. And, and also because, I mean, not to, this is a hackneyed metaphor now, but we're not all in the same boat, right? And so just because I sit, I'm sitting at home does not mean I understand the situation of, 90% of the US that's sitting at home without a job. So it's a, I think it's really opened, certainly my executive team's eyes to the fact that we, we can't make those assumptions anymore. And so the need for consumer insight um, and the need for quick consumer insight is stronger than ever. Yeah, yeah. So the end of this, that, just to kind of piggyback off of that is like a great thing for us as people on the CPG insight side and the, the digitalization of we're jumping into e-commerce for all these things is we're getting a lot more data points that we just probably wouldn't have gotten for our various customers or categories in normal times. So it's like seeing different tribes that are being established uh, on the internet around brands and products. Um, I think that that's kind of like we're entering new waters for brands we might've thought that we knew everything about before. Yeah, that's interesting. And so, to, to those kind of points were how are you really empowering your internal stakeholders to be a little bit more directly responsible for, for knowing the, the new consumer? Are you looking kind of democratizing insights within your companies? How are you getting that knowledge kind of socialized around the business? Sure, I can start. Um, you know, it's interesting because I, I've been at Kraft Heinz for 15 years and there's, you know, different, different levels of ownership with a consumer. And I think there probably was a time in, in the past where, CIS held the consumer tightly and the information tightly. And we really, you know, in the past several years and even accelerated now, um, you know, we say we're consumer obsessed. And for an organization to be consumer obsessed, you have to democratize it. I mean, you have to, and that means a lot of things. It certainly can mean tools like a Suzy or other, or, you know, um, uh, applicability to some type of trend platform for them and, and access for them. Um, but it can also mean like, how do I, like, how do I excite my team? How do I get them immersed? Like, so we have so much data. Um, you know, a lot of times what we need are stories, you know, stories and experiences. So I want, like, for me, a win is if I take a team to the store um, to, uh, for a shop along, or I take them in home or online now for an interview with consumers, and then I'm in a meeting and I hear them playing back those insights, like, that's a huge win. Like, because I feel like if you know people, um, people, consumers, then you can break, you know, communicate to them. You can innovate for them. You don't necessarily have to be spoon fed every, every thing because you know them as people. So I just think that's so critical to really uh, democratize insights, certainly for our marketing and R&D partners, but also for the broader organization who are making decisions because everything should be consumer led. So it's an exciting time. Mm -hmm. Nick and Elliot, do you have interesting ways of sharing data across the business? So I think, um, so we've been running a series of one-on-one -on -one immersions for some time for our, um, our marketers and outside the marketing team as well. Exactly to what Kim said is I think, um, I always feel like insights is consumer centricity. It shouldn't just be the responsibility of the insights department. In fact, we're doing something wrong if it is just the responsibility of the insights department. So we've been pushing to really bring the broader organization in to give them opportunities to meet consumers, whether that's literally or now more virtually, obviously. I think one of the things that's helped um, a lot, and Kim, you talked about this, which is there's just, there's so much data. And particularly during COVID, it's like, I, I honestly, I think I drowned in the first few weeks of COVID because everybody had a tracker and everybody had a report on this, that and the other. Um, and I think what's actually been helpful, what, the, what my portfolio team have done an amazing job of is um, sort of synthesizing into themes. So it's like people's reaction to hygiene, um, how consumers and shoppers are feeling about the holidays. So we've tried to make it a bit more thematic, which is just a bit easier to comprehend than this constant um, set of numbers. And then we've actually found um, online panel discussions with consumers. So bringing in a group of consumers who are obviously kind of pre-vetted to, to um, make sure it's going to be a good discussion. Bringing them in and having a conversation has been one of the most powerful ways for a lot of people to just hear the consumer voice and then hear the differing opinions as well. And actually that's often been a prompt to people across the organization in sales, in R&D and all different functions to say, 
is there any chance I can maybe do a one-on-one -on -one immersion with the consumer? And I'm like, yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> we can definitely set that up. But it's, I think sort of pushing out that content exactly as Kim said in a um, friendly, digestible storytelling way is a human, I mean, it's human way, right? You just want to make it as human as possible. Love that. I love yeah. you have people going to you asking, can I get, can I speak to a consumer please today? That's wonderful. This is like a topic I'm super passionate about. Um, I, I like the terminology of like enabling the end user. I usually call it arming the marketer. And what I mean by that is like, I'm a little bit different, I think, in, in, with the fact that we're dealing with brand new brand creation, business creation. But, you know, in traditional like brand marketing world, the brand marketing is, is dealing with a really complex matrix of partners, um, both within and outside of the organization. This ranges from, you know, whoever's doing your data and insights to external agencies that are help with creative and audience analysis. It just, it goes on. Depending on the, the business, it can be uh, a different um, setup. But I think that when you have like new brand creation, you want to arm the marketer with as much data and consumer insights as possible um, for them to gather them, analyze them and, you know, put them to work. And I think this is kind of like uh, where a couple of years ago, we we're always talking about pushing uh, agile as a cultural shift. The new cultural shift you hear everywhere is this culture of experimentation. Um, and part of the culture of experimentation, I think if it's done correctly, um, is that the marketer should have all of this at their fingertips or at least close by. Because if you're going to be making decisions on the fly and the, the speed and the demands that we're seeing that people have currently within their teams, uh, there's not a lot of time to work with like a really complex network of agencies and divisions. It's not that, uh, we have, that we have amazing insights teams that could flow into work with you. But when it comes to kind of making a new brand and making decisions on the fly, it's so much more helpful if you as a marketer wield that information. Yeah, that makes sense. So with all of this data that you've, you've all kind of inundated with, what has been some of the most interesting learnings that you found out about your specific consumers and, and how they've evolved over the last few months? I love hearing about interesting habits and, and things you've found. Kim, obviously we saw that uh, people are eating mac and cheese for breakfast, which is great they for always, me. They always were. <laughs> so, I'm talking um, about it. By people you mean me. I, I've been doing it. Exactly. It's a, it's a judgment free zone everyone, don't we? <laughs> no judgment, not at all. Um, you know, I, I think, but that's a really a great point. It's, you know, you've seen people go back, like I've seen a few things. People go to, in the beginning, so like very primal behavior around survival. And it wasn't necessarily rational, and it certainly wasn't aspirational. It was literally survival. It was, I need to feed my family. So when I go to the store and the shelves are bare, my heart's going to pound because it makes me scared that I can't do that. So like being able to address those consumer pain points, you know, like that was number one, you know, like consumer insights goes aside, marketing goes aside. How do we get product on the shelf? So, and how do we, that by doing that, we're addressing those consumer pain points. So like that was that was something really critical. But then you started to see, you know, people, you know, pivoting off of that, more baking. So people were going back to baking, either for fun, because now they had time to cook, we saw more cooking, or even the baking perspective, they, they felt in control. Because if they had a bag of flour, well, now I can make 100 loaves of bread. You know, it doesn't matter what, you know, what, what's going on in the world. Um, we saw that, you know, I saw the acceleration of some of the, um, back to an earlier comment, some of the functional food trends that we've seen start, right? Well, like immunity. So things that, you know, that you would start to see before, a lot of these were now accelerated and people were looking for that, you know, within their food. That was interesting. Um, just to um, piggyback on what Kim said, I think one of the interesting things for me, and again, it's not, it's not like we hadn't seen it before, but again, it's like everything during the last six months, I feel like it's become more extreme in a way, is we've seen this real bifurcation of the ends of the spectrum. So we saw people flocking towards, and in our consumption tracking, really reporting a need for health and health consciousness. So whether that was weight management or um, immunity, as you say, right, that's obviously a big trend. It will continue to be a big trend. Antioxidants, vitamins. And I think one of actually the big drivers of that was the way breakfast changed. So breakfast has become so much longer. I mean, again, no judgment if anybody's sitting in their PJs at 2 p.m. having breakfast. 
definitely didn't happen to me this today. Um, <laughs> but so it's uh, it, that's that's changed like on the health side of the of the equation, and then on, on completely on the opposite end, you've seen this huge surge in comfort food and a lot of those center store brands which um had been declared somewhat stagnant you know had seen huge growth whether that's chilled or or shelf staple have seen incredible growth and the sort of need for comfort and indulgence and reassurance and those big brands that i know and well and, and the sort of nostalgia with that um and it's interesting as you know as we've looked at our consumption tracking even with the same people you're seeing those bifurcations happening right so i want immunity i'm thinking about my health in the morning and then i'm thinking about indulgence at 4 p.m in the afternoon and again nothing that is entirely new but you've seen some real um kind of uh accelerations and exacerbations of those which has been really fascinating to see yeah and we're definitely seeing that too and that was actually right the craft yeah. mac and cheese example of just latching on to like that's a classic comfort food exactly and not only is it a comfort food but it also taps into probably childhood and security and those you know kind of really warm feelings so not surprised even that team you know tapped into that and even the fact that behaviors have changed breakfast looks different it might be craft mac and cheese it might be you know a variety of things so yeah we've seen you know that that kind of bifurcation we've seen that as well super interesting yeah i think on the same vein um kind of like looking at how you guys talked about like products playing a role in comfort is we started to see like more and more like beauty and personal care products are a lot bigger of a driver for wellness and holistic well-being than we initially thought which is a great opportunity for brands right where it's before you might have thought that you're, you have this purely functional approach um, or something to do with aesthetics when in reality you know a face mask um, or what you used to go to a salon for wasn't purely for the looks aspect of it it was also some sort of personal care that you know it was relaxing it was your way to unwind I remember this happening to me like one one or two in when I really wanted a haircut when I realized that a haircut is like so much more than just a haircut like you feel like for the next two weeks you're Superman so I think brands um, probably didn't really realize how 3D, three-dimensional their role was in a consumer's life. Um, and I think that, that that gives a huge opportunity for brands to tap into like how they play into a holistic well-being. Yeah, absolutely. And our, of course our habits and our routines have changed. Skincare routines have changed. Hair care routines have certainly changed. My dark hair is coming through, but I'm embracing it. <laughs> Uh, and so on. It's fascinating to see that kind of evolution of the consumer and how how they um, kind of evolved over time. And of course, we all saw the trends of you know, banana bread at the very beginning and, and so on. Um, one of Susie's other clients, Crayola, really mentioned the, you know, the kind of adult coloring and adult calligraphy that they're seeing as well. And I know that I'm certainly getting into, into kind of the, what are my winter habits going to be? <laughs> because in the summer, it was maybe going out and exercising and What's that going to look like when I'm inside and it's dark outside in the evenings? So, yeah. Changing tracks a little bit then about, um, so talking about specifically market research methodologies, and we've touched upon this a lot as we've kind of gone through today. Has it, this might be an interesting word to use, but has it been a kind of a fun last six months, really experimenting with these new methodologies and uh, having to really quickly adapt to, to, to using different tools? Not sure if the word fun was the correct word, but know, it's, it's, it's the word, the word fun. I was like, uh, um, yeah. <laughs> I think this, this, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I was going to say there's two ways to answer that. Fun being, I, I'm sure we've wanted to have this seat at the table that Nick was talking about before for a long time. So fun in the sense of getting to kind of play out strategies and methodologies that have been in the back of our head for a long time. Yes fun in the traditional sense speaking about all of it it's probably been a bit difficult definitely challenging um but that challenge has been kind of the most stimulating thing i think has happened in cbg in the last couple of years is definitely a pleasure to be a part of that and i think the um the benefit is you know not to use the trope but it's like we're not all in the same boat and there is kind of for the first time in you know, in the last couple of years since there's been like a similar crisis, if there has been, the opportunity to kind of sit back and say, I'm really creating a methodology and, and reacting to something 
and you're thinking less so from like a theoretical blanket solution and you're thinking very zoned on your consumer brand category portfolio company etc so i think that that is if, as fun as that can be that's fun um but i think challenging and uh rewarding i think more so than fun so I'll, I'll jump in on the fun piece. One of the things is I think about new, trying out new methodologies, which I have done in the past six months. Um, it is fun sometimes to play with a shiny new toy. And I think one of the things I have to learn too is um, are the benefits of a certain platform are trying, are they helping me deliver my goal as a professional and for the organization? You know, sometimes it's maybe bells and whistles, but it didn't really deliver what I needed to. So. While I've had fun experimenting, I think it also helped me understand what I need and what I don't need to meet those objectives for myself and what my you know, stakeholders within my organization need um, and for the business. So I, I, you know, I have a, a, a stronger point of view on that after experimenting more, which is always fun. Yeah, I think, I mean, just to um, synthesize, like it's, it's certainly not been boring. Definitely mm -hmm. can say that. Um, and there's definitely been moments, I think, for all of us where the challenge has been really energizing, whether it's the challenge of the deadline, the, the change, the new methodology, and freeing in many respects, for all the reasons we talked about, right, in terms of freeing from some of the constraints we maybe had, or, you know, just the freedom within the constraint, because suddenly we had to do something that we've never done before in a different time frame, and that just opened up new paths and opportunities. I think um, to something, um, we were just saying, I do think, Kim, you were just talking about this, which is, I think also because it's allowed us to experiment more with different methodologies and different approaches, I do think it's helped us and the business understand what's right for what, right? So I do think we need to be careful that not everything should be, not everything can or should be done in a speedy, well, I say a speedy way, in not everything should be done through every platform if they're the same platform yeah. i guess is my point point. and so i think i've been managing up the last couple of weeks is there's almost become oh you can do everything quickly you can absolutely everything can be done in 10 seconds and i'm like okay so lots of things can be and lots of time sensitive stuff can now be done really quickly and that's great but there is there is, there are you know when you're trying to really understand the deep drivers and motivations of human behavior Funnily enough, that can't necessarily be solved in a survey overnight. And so I think just helping navigate the business. I will say one thing that's been helpful is actually being able to answer some of some of the questions really quickly and show the impact we can make. I think has given a little bit of freedom to say, but we're going to need more time to do this deeper piece of research that's really going to uh, dig deeper. Um, and so I think it's to exactly to you, to you were saying, Kim, but it's help, helped us, but it's also helped us frame it up to the business of there can be speed and there can be things where we need more time and more depth and more deliberation. But it's almost like you can start to buy one off against the other um, in a different way than I've felt in the past. But again, that's still sort of evolving in my head. Yeah. And I guess to go full circle with, on it, uh, on the kind of being fun or exciting, like, if we can't make it exciting, it's going to be difficult to get in the buy-in from all the other teams that we need to come along for the ride. So I think there is a sense of fun and excitement because we got to get, we got to transfer that to other teams and stakeholders so they feel the same thing. Yeah. And I know that in the last number of years in, in insights, there's obviously been this kind of increased, uh, increased pressure on, on budgets and speed. Um, and of course, whilst maintaining quality, how's that playing out for you towards kind of the back end of 2020? And are you, do we see that trend continue into 2021, do you think? Or do you see that the businesses are now starting to see the, the, the necessity for insights and goodness knows if we would see an increase in budgets in 2021? How's that playing out in your businesses right now? Um, I think for me, uh, the teams, like actually Craft Times is, is reinvesting in the consumer and the function and the insight. So I think we aren't necessarily being pushed to cut budgets. I do think though, agile or fast, whether it's right or wrong, I'm getting, you know, getting the same push of like, how can everything be faster? So having those conversations and the reality is there's a lot of stuff that can be faster. So that's starting to become more of an anti um, for the organization for many things. And so faster and cheaper 
Um, and even quality is the ante. Like where I'm seeing some conversations and support, it's back to my point about how can you help me in my career and how can you help the organization? So, you know, supply on the supplier side, you can help me on in my career by making sure I'm not spending a lot of time programming a questionnaire or doing things that aren't value added. I'll never get on my review. Well, Kim sure, you know, turn Kim saved us money or Kim turn those results around fast, even though that's an ask, it's going to be about my influence on the organization and where I can push the agenda. So where so, so when I think about solutions, the ante if the ante is fast, the ante is quick, the ante is quality, where are those partners that can help me focus on the storytelling? And you can help me focus on the storytelling by making it the platform simple, or maybe even there's managed service. Where else can you help me make that deliverable, you know, kind of push of a button and I can write, I can spend the time writing the, uh, the influential statements and, and what I know about the business. So that's where I see of like the next unlock for me as a professional um, and helping me in my career. And then again, helping the organization because then I'm spending my time on what's most important and I, and what I think will drive will drive the business. Yeah, I think to just just to um, piggyback again on Kim, I think again with the PepsiCo, it's less about less money. It's more about how you spend that money in the most impactful way, right? I think it's kind of what you were saying. Now, it was um, the question I'm getting is to exactly to what you're saying is what can be done in a leaner way? I and mean, leaner means faster. Um, doesn't you know? doesn't need as much detail, um, doesn't require as much resources on like human resources in terms of my team and, and the marketing team. So what can we say, what can we automate, make leaner so that we can actually spend our time and our money on different things, whether that's human storytelling and going deeper with the and really getting under the skin of what's driving human behavior, which is the, some of the stuff that the other tools are not designed necessarily to get you into that same level of debt. And also to think about um, I think if we're just in responsive, reactive, fast mode, we're also forgetting to build the capabilities that will help us avoid some of those things or, or predict and pro uh, provide for some of those things in the future. So the other thing we're thinking about is, as well as what are the capabilities we need to build, whether that's data science capabilities, modeling, um, even some of the, the fundamentals of, how, of what we've learned, you know, the knowledge capabilities so that you're actually advancing the fundamentals and we can better predict what's going to happen in future as opposed to just answer questions in, in the short term. So it's more about reapportioning money from the things that were, that exactly as Kim said, the lots of things that could be done faster and leaner so we can actually spend more time and money on the stuff that will make a bigger, longer term impact. Yeah, that last point is 100% what I see. I think what we're going to see coming out of this is that a lot of the things that we're able to do quicker will stick, but uh, we'll see that a lot of things that we you know, did quicker probably could have been done way better if we gave it time. Um, so there's a delicate balance between those things. But I think that overall, a lot of processes are gonna be made leaner, more agile. And like when I was speaking earlier about getting that build measure loop pinwheel going, um, getting that going I think we're going to try to in the future do with less and less money and resource spend um, so that when we do start making decisions that are resource intensive, um, there is validation behind them. Yeah, that's a really good point. And do you see your functions changing in any way in as you look into 2021? Is the insights function going to be needed in other parts of the business? It's not currently today, maybe? It's a tough question. <laughs> that, that created some silence. Um, I think so. I think yes, yes. I think there's. I mean, I think what COVID and everything else associated with COVID, um, plus all the social justice movements of the last six months. I think, I think what if anything, it's put consumer centricity and consumer insights more at the forefront of everybody's agenda. And so, again, back to what I was saying before, I feel like we've gotten more pull not only from our senior executive team, but from functions that were much more on the periphery of insights um, purview before. And so it's interesting, you know, we were trying to do stakeholder mapping before all of our big projects about who are all the people 
who we should influence. And it's interesting that the, the cross functionals on those lists are getting broader and wider because suddenly there's a lot more people who could be interested, but they're in supply chain or finance or R and D and how much it will change and how quickly, I don't know, but I do feel that what this has done is to everything we've said, it's opened the aperture, I think for insights to have a broader impact on the organization. Um, I think it's just going to be about how we prioritize all of that and which battles we go and pick up and, and fight. Um, so it's, it's a bit of an unsatisfactory answer. I don't know, but it's certainly, I think mm. the potential, the door is open to that for sure. Yeah. I think that with like the last five and 10 years where you saw more about data and analytics and literacy was kind of the main focus where sort of people who are outside of those um, divisions were kind of like, get literate enough to interface with the analytics team. And now I think the, the next level of that is like how to get your hands dirty in it. Like more and more people who don't strictly have a data analytics or consumer research role will have to be doing some form of data analytics or consumer research. Um, and how exactly that's gonna evolve is kind of really dependent on your organization and the projects that are coming out of this, I think. Um, so yeah, also not a super satisfactory answer because there's a lot of um, question marks still up. But I think that because everyone's all hands on deck, because uh, analytics and insights are kind of becoming the backbone of a lot of rapid decision making, you're gonna see it kind of through osmosis kind of go into more and more other roles. Mm. Yeah, I get, I'm seeing more of uh, the merge of IT and CIS, right? So it's like a lot of conversations that I didn't have before. And even back to budget, like where we, we're not cutting budgets, we're reinvesting in areas that we still have opportunity to build. So I, you know, I think for, for me, as I think about, um, you know, the back half of 2020 and 2021, it's moving in that direction. I think me personally, I'm um, inspired by that notion of digestible, engaging insights. And if I were to put my content creator hat, I want to create content, like just like I do for consumers, if it's advertising, that my organization wants to read yeah. and wants to share and wants to get excited. So like, that's my personal goal. Like, how do I start to do that? How do I start to tell stories that people are, you know, turning to their neighbor? Did you read that? Or people are sharing or people are talking about. So I think trying to move from, you know, the 100 page decks to the really impactful and maybe more frequent check ins with the organization uh, would for me would be a personal win. I think just one thing I was going to say on that as well, I think that the other thing that's struck me in the last few months is that there's a real opportunity for us to try and set the agenda more than respond to it. Um, and I think, you know, this is a long journey of transition we've been on from the historical days of market research, right? Those executing an agenda. I think um, because people have been coming to the insights and analytics teams more in the last six months and looking for guidance and what, literally what does the future look like and what should I do here? I think exactly to what you were saying, Kim, I think there's really an opportunity for us more frequently to be going to the business and using the wealth of data and insight we have to reframe challenges, to say, what about this direction? What about this opportunity? Um, and I think opening the business's eyes to things that maybe, I think we can be the outside in view, right? And bring some of the things that are going on and re help reframe the business agenda. And so again, I think, and obviously that's more than just some of our traditional historical role within marketing or whichever business unit we support. I think that obviously has much broader implications for the wider business. So yeah, I, I think, Again, it sort of reinforces, I think, there's, a, there's an opening opportunity here for insights. That's great to hear. And so if we were to summarize, what advice would you give to other business leaders about the future of insights? There are three key things. Um, I'll jump in. Gosh, you know, the three things or the advice. I would say, um, Speaking to researchers, I would say be curious, be willing to take risk. It's okay. You know, like sometimes um, fast good is better than perfection and, and being able to understand when that's right. Um, but be brave. Like I would say be brave and have fun. I do think we should have, this is a very cool job and it's very exciting mm -hmm. and um, like enjoy that and, and be passionate about it. 
knew the word fun was the right word after all. <laughs> Gently seeded in there earlier. You looked, uh, music, I ran a full yeah. circle for you. You did, you did. Yeah. <laughs> I think be uh, brave, I would say. Sorry, Elliot. No, go ahead. Um, I was going to say, I think, I think bravery um, and the willingness to challenge our, our orthodoxy, that of the business, I think there's never been a better opportunity to do that. So whether that's leaning into more, to leaner, uh, more agile, less traditional methodologies, whether that's pushing back against uh, a view of the consumer or the category that feels outdated. I, I think bravery and courage to me is the heart of, I think, what we as an entire function need to need to really lean into. And, and actually the last, the evidence of the last six months should give us the, the courage and the fire to do that. Because I think we, you know, as, as as Elliot was saying before, I mean, data is data and insights to me at least is the new oil, right? There's so much power in that, and I think we should be using that and not not be sitting on the sidelines. We should be using that to really set and drive the agenda. So yeah, just have the courage of your convictions. That's what I think I would say. Love that. So I think my three are immediately put into short. Um, memorable lines. I think the first one is test early, test often. Um, I hold this like really dear to my heart. I think it kind of encapsulates a lot of the arguments that we're saying. Um, is to go out, <clears throat> test it, get some feedback and iterate and be open to that. I think the second is um, strong beliefs held loosely. So be open to change, be open to like what, when you go out and start testing, uh, try to leave your biases at the door, try to leave past performance at the door and really embrace. And that kind of flows perfectly into the third one is like, don't be afraid of new. So doing things that are different and new at first, especially if you're with an established brand that has a way of doing things can feel like, why would I put resources towards something that is risky and might work when I can put those same dollars and hours behind things that have worked and we have proof of. But um, I think for all the categories that involve for, for all three of us, a lot of the new customers that you're going to be attracting are going to come from new things and trying new things. Um, so yeah, just to sum that up, it's test early, test often, strong beliefs loosely held, and uh, don't be afraid of anything new. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. This has been absolutely wonderful um, to, to spend time with the three of you. It's been absolutely great to find out more about your your categories, your insights, and I'm, I'm leaving this chat absolutely hopeful for 2021. Um, and you're right, Kim, you mentioned this is a really fun job. So um, thank you so much for joining me on the virtual stage today. And I really hope that our audience was able to, to learn a lot from the three of you. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you thank so you much. Katie. Thanks, Thanks so much for having us.